Okay. Are you guys ready to get started? Finally. Start here. HTML. Yeah, that looks pretty good actually. Hey yo. You guys are all on the screencast. <laughs> Gonna be famous. <laughs> What's that? No, I don't. Maybe I'll wait. <laughs> All right, let's get started, guys. We've been waiting way too long in here. It's just we're just getting very impatient. Um, so today I'm going to do a talk on tool or die. Um, it's just basically tools that I use to develop websites. And actually, um, instead of an agenda, I'm just going to go over an unagenda. Um, number one, I'm not going to talk about how to install anything that I'm going over because that is tedious and annoying. Um, and number two, um, I'm not going to talk about version control. It's a non-negotiable tool. You need to use it. If you're not using it, then I don't want to work with you. Um, so, I almost uh, titled this talk www.dwwzd, which is what, what World Wide Web Development Workflow exactly do. But I didn't because it's not very descriptive. But today I'm actually going to go through the process of building my slideshow and using that to describe the tools that I use. So, without further ado, let's build these slides. Um, but first, a little bit about my IDE of choice. I use Sublime Text 2. It's cross-platform. It works on Windows, Mac. Um, it's very fast. It's very easy to configure. It has awesome plugins, which I'll go over a few of them. Um, but I didn't always use Sublime Text 2, obviously, because it's fairly new. Uh, in my development life, I've switched my primary editor six times, six different times. Um, I think the first one that I used seriously was called Alaire Home Site, which is really dating me. Um, early 2000s. I don't know if that's dating someone, but <clears throat> that's what I used back in the day. Um, but Sublime Text 2 isn't. I'm not. This isn't like one big commercial for Sublime Text 2. Okay, I'm talking about things that I use in Sublime Text 2 that you should be able to do in any code editor. Um, and if your code editor doesn't do these things, why not? Maybe you should think about switching. So some of my favorite features of Sublime Text 2 and um, my bare minimum going forward for if I ever choose a new editor um, is quick products, project switching and file switching. So in Sublime Text there is um, control Command P, which brings up your list of projects. Um, here's my presentation here, and you can use the arrow keys to select which one you want, or you can type in, and it will autocomplete there. Um, and then also there is oops, Command P, which brings up your file um, chooser. So I can do, I can bring up the start here file, which is my very first initial slide including the nice Wayne's World animation that you saw um, that I borrowed from a lovely developer off codepen.io, which is a site just to demo, um, demo neat CSS things. Um, <clears throat> you can see I'm using the Schwing um, BG animation here. Um, but yeah, so that's how to do project switching and file switching. That's something that's very important when you're working with a bunch of files you want to be able to easily switch between them and context switching between projects is really important. Uh, syntax, syntax highlighting, I need it for HTML, CSS, JavaScript, er, and SAS. I use SAS. I'll go into that a little bit later. Um, code should be readable, should be easy to read, um, and syntax highlighting helps with that. Um, and then easy plugin management. So there's an amazing plugin ecosystem, and I'll go through some of my favorite Sublime um, plugins. Um, I want to be able to easily convert between spaces and tabs, so I bring up a document someone checked in. They didn't have white space viewable in their editor, and they checked in some spaces into my tabs file. 
um, I want to be able to easily, with a single keystroke, um, convert all of those spaces into tabs or vice versa. I personally use tabs for my project. Um, I didn't always, but that's where I'm at right now. And I don't want to get into that holy war right now either. So. Um, <clears throat> Another great thing I like in Sublime Text is to be able to swap lines without the clipboard. It's also known as line bubbling. Um, so in this file particularly, I can hold down Option and push up. That will move that, that line around for me. Um, does that work with blocks? Yes, it does. So that's a really nice feature. Um, let's see. I like to see my white space. Again, you should be consistent with tabs and spaces and don't check shit into my project when I'm using tabs and you check something with spaces, it really pisses me off. Um, let's see, I want to be able to duplicate lines without the clipboard. Um, so if I want to create multiples of this, I should be able to do that easily. And I have it bound to command, control, up and down works with blocks as well. And I also like to have some visual integration with my source control. So for example, um, Sublime Text has Git Gutter, which is a plugin you can install, which will show you all the changes that you made to your current file that aren't checked in. So you can kind of see on the left there are those little dots are things that I haven't checked into my local repo. And I'll show. So if I save here, it'll show up here. <clears throat> I use GitX um, for my visual Git stuff. I'm not really going to go over it too much, but the one nice thing about Git is it, GitX is that you can stage individual lines um, instead of your files. So if you don't want to commit all of your changes for a specific file, you can go into Git X and just um, stage a few of the lines. <laughs> no problem. Oh. Uh -huh. Not That's going to be on the screencast. <laughs> um, so, let's see. Get Gutter's real great plugin. Let's go on. So, let's get back to building the slides. Um, so, if we go to the source code that I'm using here, I'm just going to go through a little bit of web development uh, trivia here. So we don't have, there's these weird characters that are showing up on my page. Um, and what are those? They're smart quotes. So I'm kind of opinionated about quotes and typography. So you, when you're using quotes, you should use the correct quotes. Um, you shouldn't use the dumb quotes. So dumb quotes are just... In code, it's fine, obviously, because that's what um, all your workflow deals with. But um, <clears throat> those are dumb quotes. These are oh, smart quotes. They look a little bit nicer. Makes it easier to read. I'll have a little bit better example of that later. Um, so if you look at our character set, those are actually Unicode characters. And the reason we're getting multiple characters here is because Unicode stores things in multiple bytes. Um, the default character set that comes back in the HTML page is just ISO 88591 in Chrome. Um, and so it doesn't know how to interpret those characters, and it just attempts to interpret them as best as it knows how. And the guesses um, are incorrect, obviously. Um, so if you want to read about quotes and accents, here's a nice page. And all these slides are available on Git, uh, on my GitHub profile, so you can go out here and Look at how awesome the source code is. It doesn't ever read me. But it'll at least give you uh, the ability to go back and reference all these links that I'm using. There are going to be quite a few related links that I'm going to go through. Um, so you don't need to take notes, obviously. We just go back and look at them later. So the character set, uh, you just this is just JavaScript. That'll tell me what character set I'm using on the page. Um, one way to manually fix it is to use an HTML entity. So if you have ever used um, ampersand AMP uh, semicolon, you might be familiar with HTML entities. 
They're just a way to, without, a char without changing the character encoding, a way to force Unicode characters to be interpreted correctly. Um, but this isn't really the correct way to fix it, in my opinion, but it's an option that you have to use. You can see the character set hasn't changed for the document, but it's still interpreting the character correctly. Another way to fix it is JavaScript strings are Unicode. Um, so if I do a document write, where it is, here we go. A document write with the same four number combination here um, that I used for the um, character or the HTML entity, um, I can output that string and it will write correctly. So this is actually a JavaScript string here that's getting injected into the page. So, so here's an example of using CSS. I'm using the after pseudo element to inject HTML content onto the page. Um, but it's not, again, it's not interpreting it correctly because we don't have an HTML character set set for the document. So this is actually CSS content right here after this string here. We can see that in the developer tools. So you notice there is no content after the end of the paragraph. Um, and then if we look over to the right, you can see that content as injected uses, using the uh, pseudo element. So when we add a character set to our HTML, yeah, that's going to get out of control here. When we add a character set to our HTML using either a meta tag or a HTTP header, it fixes it. So this is CSS content here. This smart quote here is just raw in our HTML. Uh, it's a Unicode character. And so the document knows how to interpret that. <clears throat> and it will pass it, in, pass it into the character set. Even though we're not setting the character encoding of the CSS specifically, just the fact that we have a meta care set tag on the page will force the care set for the CSS content. You can also add a character set in the <clears throat> CSS manual if you want to do that. It's a lot of stuff about character encoding, sorry. Um, it's another method that you can use. Let's try and work through this a little bit faster. But the correct global fix, like I said earlier, is to add that meta care set tag or set it using an HTTP header. And you can do that with HT access. And here's a sample stolen from HTML5 boilerplate. Um, it's important to note that it's preferred to set the character encoding inside of the HTTP header. If you don't, um, your page will render a little bit slow, slower. So when a browser goes out and downloads an HTML page, and you guys can go and read that later, but when a browser goes out and fetches this HTML page, it attempts to um, parse the first, I think, one or two kilobyte looking for that meta tag if it doesn't know what character encoding to use. Um, and if the guess that it thought the document was going to be encoded in is, doesn't match the one that you're using, it has to actually re-render the page. So there's some lost work there. Um, so if you set that in HTTP header, it already knows before it's downloaded any content, uh, any of the HTTP body um, for the HTML, it already knows what character encoding it needs to do, and there's no, it won't ever reset and re-render. I mean, you won't be able to see that visually, but um, you're just giving away milliseconds at that point. So here's more examples of dumb quotes and smart quotes. Um, so you use the correct quotes, guys. Come on, it's not that hard. Um, and also there's... If you're going to talk about inches, it's not the same quote. <laughs> it's different. So you want to be able to visually tell the difference between um, what you're talking about. So what if I want to do uh, Arabic? I want to put some Arabic in my slideshow. Um, 
That would be fine if I included the character encoding, but I didn't. So let's add it. This is it. I don't know. Google Translate told me that this was the correct string to use. I don't actually speak Arabic. Um, and then if you want to use a separate language, you want to add the, the lang attribute too here at the top. And you can nest that um, inside of different tags as well. If, you, if I just wanted Arabic on this, oh, and I should have added that. What am I doing? Okay, so slide zero. Oh. Slide zero. <clears throat> Let's fix it real quick. Man, so awesome. Okay, I don't want to see that. So I have two separate lang attributes here because obviously I'm using two separate languages in this file. <clears throat> so, but this still isn't quite right because Arabic reads from right to left and the browser doesn't change the rendering direction solely based on the lang attribute. So you need to add a dir attribute to show that it reads from right to left. Question? No? <clears throat> so, let's talk browser support for this slideshow. Um, how many guys are familiar with graded browser support? A couple of people. Um, so, really this is just a way to hedge your um, hedge your bets, I guess, on uh, old browsers, supporting old browsers. So if you use progressive enhancement, which means you start with HTML, layer on the CSS, and then add the JavaScript later, um, it really isn't a problem to support super old browsers like IE6, uh, IE7, BlackBerry 4. You just serve them the raw HTML. Um, you don't serve them any JavaScript. You don't serve them any CSS. They just get the content. Um, so that's what we talk about when we're just doing C grade, and that's what I've, that's what I've done so far. All these slides have just been raw HTML, um, no CSS, no JavaScript. Um, and some people do a B grade um, with varying support for CSS and feature tested JavaScript. So I'll go over that a little bit later, but I'm not really going to do that for this slideshow project. I don't do it for personal projects. Um, professionally, I definitely would do this um, because it's important because Windows XP is still um, I think it's at 40% right now of, of worldwide usage. Um, and Windows XP newest default browser is IE8. Um, so uh, it, it's still really important to support IE8. I'm not going to do it for this slideshow because I'm not a glutton and you guys probably aren't ever going to use IE8 for, to view these slides. Um, but professionally, I definitely would still support IE8 moving forward. Um, and then A grade, um, which is HTML with full CSS, full responsive layout, full feature tested JavaScript. Um, that is your top tier modern browsers. And we'll get to that later eventually. I'll show you how to separate those. So, how do you cut the mustard? Once you've decided what grades of uh, experience to serve to your slideshow viewers, if you will, um, you should pick a feature that matches your definition of a modern browser and then fork on it. So inside of my JavaScript, I have an, a big if statement at the top that says, if the browser has query selector all support inside of the document object, um, then I'll execute all the rest of my JavaScript on the page. And that will give me IE8 plus, BlackBerry 5 plus, um, and anything that doesn't support query selector all, um, we'll just fail that uh, feature test, and it won't execute any JavaScript. So um, it's a good way to separate your C-grade experience from your A-grade experience. Um, and this is the one that jQuery Mobile used in version 1.0. Um, does the page support CSS3 media queries? Um, they have their own feature tests um, behind these. Um, and also an exception for IE and IE greater than 7. So <coughs> jQuery Mobile support. Uh, it serves an A grade experience to um, IE7 plus. Um, but for the purposes of this slideshow, I'm going to do uh, a little bit more progressively use get elements by class name, um, which is going to get me BlackBerry 7 plus and IE9 plus. And really, I judge my browser support based on IE and BlackBerry because they're like the lowest common denominator of browsers. So inside of CSS, you can also sort of fork 
experiences as well. So here's a CSS3 media query um, that has, it's just basically the only all selector. Um, so any code that you put inside of this, any selectors and blocks, CSS blocks that you put inside of this, is only going to be parsed um, by IE9 and above um, because IE8 doesn't support um, CSS3 media queries. And if you want to get even more granular down inside of your individual selectors, you could you can add this root element or this root, sorry, uh, pseudo element here, um, which is basically just an alias for um, your HTML tag on your page. So any selectors that you put to the right of that, let me, oops, I didn't name my files very good in the beginning. So for example, if I wanted to style all of my paragraph tags inside of IE9 plus and anything else that supported this root selector, um, I would do it like that. So maybe I'll do red. I mean, obviously you wouldn't surf different color text to IE9 plus, but um, this is just as just an example. I did actually use this the other day to do custom um, checkboxes um, on modern browsers. So I didn't. The, one of the designs we were working on um, wanted a different visual representation of a checkbox, which is not something I would do again for a personal project because it's a checkbox, right? Who cares? Um, just make it a checkbox. But um, the client wanted it, so we made it happen. And we made it happen only on newer browsers. So we don't have to use any JavaScript to do this feature test. This, is all, this all lives in just our, um, our uh, CSS. <clears throat> Oops. So if you want to use, um, see what browser support is for a feature that you want to fork on, you can use can I use. Here's one for a query selector. Um, can I use.com has a bunch of different uh, browser support matrices, matrices, sorry, um, that you can go out and check out and decide what you want to fork on yourself. One of the things that I wish uh, can I use had was older Blackberries, but it doesn't. So, tough luck. I guess you have to buy one off Craigslist or something. So, as I kind of discussed, um, these are the ones I'm going with for the slideshow. I did actually tack on um, Window.blackberry, which is a JavaScript variable that Blackberry exposes, and I wanted only the WebKit Blackberry, so I used window.webkit point, which is um, just a WebKit specific property, so that will give me Blackberry 6 plus instead of Blackberry 7 plus, because Black Blackberry switched from non-WebKit, their own little thing, to a WebKit browser in Blackberry 6. Um, so I wanted to opt that in as well, so all of you guys that have Blackberry 6s, Check my slideshow out. <clears throat> so this this chosen browser support fork here is going to give me BlackBerry 6, Android 2X, iOS, Windows Phone 7.5. Um, it's not an exact science. Um, I don't need to worry about browsers that no one's using anymore. Um, for instance, Firefox 3, uh, WebOS. You don't need to go back and specifically look for exclusions for those browsers. If no one's using them, don't worry about them. We kind of already talked about IE8. And Windows XP. So another great site you can check out is I want to use. This is something put together by Paul Kinlan. Um, so I can actually go out and put, I think, get elements by class name. This is what I decided to fork on. And then hopefully it will load. It loads there. And then there's a section that tells you what features you can use for free <coughs> inside of your page without having to worry about browser support. So because I'm forking on get elements by class name, I can use um, PNG, PNGs with alpha transparency. Um, I can use the new HTML5 semantic elements. Um, and so that gives you a nice um, white list of things that you can use with, without really having to worry about too much.
Um, can I use is good, but for mobile stuff, there's a different one called mobilehtml5.org. Um, it has a little bit better browser support for <laughs> um, mobile devices. Am I tabbing too quickly? No? Okay. Just tell me to slow down or speed up, whatever. Um, so another thing that I wanted to quickly go over um, is that you need a doc type on your page to tell the browser what rendering mode to use. Um, and so the HTML5 doc type is really easy to put at the top of your page if anybody has been programming prior to 2011. Um, they love this doc type because doc types were gnarly before that. Um, so this simplifies it a lot. Um, so this tells your browser to use the newer standards rendering modes and not the quirks um, rendering modes that you would run into some really strange behavior. Um, the slideshow didn't get very complicated up to this point, so we didn't really see any problems. Um, but definitely use the doc type on your page. Um, and don't put HTML comments above it. It can trigger quirks mode in IE. Um, and if you want to check what rendering mode that you're in, you can do that in JavaScript. Um, it will tell you in compat mode. So with CSS1 compat, um, you're in standards mode. OK, but these slides still look like shit, right? Um, the HTML sucks for them. Um, look at this. I mean, this is like ugh, the worst HTML I've ever seen. So let's, oh man, this looks so much better. <laughs> so in the HTML, um, we're using a header tag uh, here to indicate that this is the head of my page, um, the header content, which is viewable by the user on the page. I'm using uh, the nav to indicate that what's embedded inside of here is navigation. This is actually an ARIA role, which is used by um, screen readers to um, determine how things on the page are being used. Um, so it's really easy. People don't really do as much accessibility stuff as they could, um, but it's it's so easy to do that why, why wouldn't you do it? So there's just like little things that you can add to your HTML that will really help out screen readers. Um, and so that's that's what I'm done here. I'm doing here with the ARIA roles. Um, and so main, this is kind of a newer HTML5 element that's, I don't believe, official, but they're cramming it down the pipe right now. Um, that's where all of your, the main body of your content goes. Um, and then an aside for related links. So those are HTML5 elements. Uh, use the ARIA roles. Oh yeah, so let's check this out in a screen reader. Um, a lot of people don't test in screen readers, which I think is a mistake, um, because people use them. <laughs> so why should we write code that doesn't work with screen readers? So I hope that, oh no. Try that out. So use Command F5. There's a built-in screen reader inside of Mac OS that you can use. It's called VoiceOver. Um, VoiceOver on Chrome. Tool or die. A web developer's workflow window. Tool or die. A web developer's workflow. HTML content has keyboard focus. So I've, I've slowed it down quite a bit. Um, generally, when people use screen readers, they're... You are currently on HTML content. To enter the web area, press Control, Option, Shift, Down Arrow. They are better at listening than I am, but they so the keystrokes for this are not nice. Um, but let's see, Control Art Shift down. Interact with tool or die. A web developer's workflow. T. Interact with text. HTML5. I'm scrolled here. H. H. No, what have I done? Stop interacting with text. Stop interacting with tool or die. A web tool or die. Interact with tool or okay. die. Entering navigation landmark. Here we go. Visited link. Next. Obviously, someone that uses this every day is going to be better at it than I am. <laughs> you are leaving navigation landmark. Entering so, main landmark. List three items. Leaving main so landmark. So here I'm, I'm in the navigation landmark. landmark. Visited link. Next. Which was the ARIA role that we that I kind of demoed to you earlier. Leaving navigation. Landmark. Now I'm going Entering into the main landmark, landmark which is items. the main body of the content. 
Um, and so I'll, I'll read out the stuff on the page. It's just raw HTML, right? So um, it's real easy to test in a screen reader. I mean, this, the, the uh, keyboard shortcuts are kind of gnarly, yes, but you are currently um, on a heading level three. It's good to at least see content. what kind of experience a screen reader might have on your page. It's interesting that it's saying the name of the markup, heading level three. So that's an H3, and it's yeah, it's actually conveying yep. the, the semantics. Yeah, so. Yep, it's voiceover so is also included. Yeah, voiceover as well. Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna demo that, but it doesn't isn't available on the emulator. So. Yeah. Stop interacting. Oh, so I'll turn it off. Voiceover off. There we go. Okay. So. Uh, Mozilla Developer Network has a great site that lists all of the uh, HTML elements that you can use. Um, so you don't have to actually go out and read the W3 spec to find out all of the HTML elements that you can use on your page. Um, <clears throat> if you're supporting IE8, um, you can't actually style the HTML5 semantic elements without a JavaScript dependency. Um, so that's just something to be aware of. For the slideshow again, we're doing IE9+. Plus. <laughs> so excited. I don't get to do that ever. But... Um, so yeah, it's just something to something to be aware of when you're writing CSS. Um, you can't write CSS selectors that interact directly with the section element or the nav element, for example. So you're gonna have to use some other mechanism to do that. Um, there's a great quick guide on the accessibilityproject.com. Um, it's a great site. They have like really really quick. Um, and short posts on how to improve the accessibility of your page. It's just like four paragraphs. You guys can totally read that. I mean, if it's my reading comprehension, you guys can totally do it. Um, really, really easy, really small posts that help you improve your accessibility. Um, and here's the one on ARIA landmark roles. I could use the one for banner, but I didn't. <clears throat> okay, so where's my... Oh. Next. So when I'm writing HTML, um, I use a tool called Emmet, um, which is, I mean, very simply, it uses CSS selectors to generate HTML. So it's really kind of nice. Oh, what slide am I on? So for example, I can do, what's the example here I have? Do that, and then I'll hit Tab. It'll automatically generate those and actually makes the tab. Uh, let's see, it, it quit out of it. What is happening? Okay. Oops. So I hit tab and then I can actually edit the content and then hit tab again. It'll take me to the next HTML content. Um, this thing can, can can get really advanced. Um, to be honest, I'm kind of an Emmet newbie, so I haven't got into some of the more advanced things. But it's really, really great when you're when you're uh, writing raw HTML. <clears throat> All right. So any element name will become an open and close tag. So, for example, if I type P um, and hit Tab, Emmet will convert that to a paragraph. Um, but it gets more advanced than that because if I just type A, it will actually generate a link element with a href attribute um, already included, and I'll put my cursor right in the href attribute so I can um, easily edit those and tab between them. And there's a bunch of other ones on the, I need to figure out this tab situation here. There's a bunch of other ones on the um, Emmet site that you can check out. It's emmet.io. Um, oh. You can create divs by default. Uh, divs? I believe it does that. Yeah, so implied, yeah, it does implied classes, and I think that's on the Emmet page as well. Okay, another tool I use is called Live Reload, and it'll actually refresh your browser for you um, while you're editing your HTML. So let's see if I can. So I have the live reload uh, program running. It doesn't actually have a. So I've added my tool or die. If 
presentation to it. So anything I edit inside of Tool or Die will actually refresh this page. Um, there's a Chrome extension here. To, there's a JavaScript um, plugin that it will inject onto your page. Um, so if you install this Chrome in, uh, extension and then click it, the little tiny little black dot means it's active. Um, so if I edit anything on the page, I'll actually reload it for me. <clears throat> so I don't have to go uh, tab between my visual representation and my editor to see changes. I can just do those live. And the great thing about Live Reload is that when you're editing CSS, it doesn't actually refresh the page. I mean, this is running localhost, so you couldn't really tell that it was doing a full page refresh. <coughs> but when you edit CSS, um, it will actually inject those style sheets for you um, without doing a full page refresh, um, which looks very seamless. So for example, let's see here. Uh, oh, that's not going to work. I need to use an external style sheet. I'll get into that later. Um, so CodeKit is another plugin that does this, uh, and a Yeoman, Yeoman, Yeoman <laughs> is a uh, something that bundles this in with their workflow as well. Um, so some quick Sublime Text shortcuts for that I use for uh, editing HTML: um, Command uh, shit, uh, Command slash uh, will toggle an HTML comment. Um, if I have a selection and I want to wrap it in uh, an HTML tag, I'll use Control Shift W. And I can it will edit those live for you, um, both the opening and closing tags. Oops. And then the really great one that blew my mind when I learned about it was um, Control D for multiple cursors. I think I have an example of that down here. So, say for example, I have this unordered list, <clears throat> and I want to change all of these list elements to paragraphs um, for whatever reason. I'll select the first one and hit Control or Command D to select the next occurrence, and you can see I have eight different cursors there, so I can type whatever I want into that. Super neat, and then. Escape will cancel those cursor editing. And then obviously it doesn't make sense instead of an owner or list. Oops. <clears throat> That's a really great one. I love that one. So you can almost do like HTML refactoring, but not really. <laughs> Let's see here. Okay, but the slides still look like shit. Um, let's work on some CSS. So up until now, really, we've only been doing HTML. <clears throat> All right, so let's zoom this appropriately. It looks so much better, right? Sans serif? Shit, it's so awesome. <laughs> um, so we use our, I'm using my CSS fork from earlier. I can show you that. Media only all, um, using box sizing, which is something you should look into, but I'm not really going to go over today. Um, so all of my code is sort of inside of this CSS3 media selector. So if I brought this up in IE or IE8, um, it would look like shit, man. It would just be the HTML that we've been doing this whole time. So much different. I'm being sarcastic. Um, but it's actually also now using um, responsive web design. So if I do this, oh man, resizing your browser to do testing is so awesome. So I have the next page down here, um, which obviously wouldn't look very good at a small resolution. Um, so I unposition fixed that element and put it at the top, um, and then related links. Uh, those are also absolutely positioned at the bottom. <clears throat> so, let me see my next button here. Um, so I have a few tips for CSS authoring. Um, don't go overboard on fonts, on web fonts. Um, you need to watch the page weight. 
Um, so don't use more than one or two if absolutely necessary web form. Um, use CSS lint. So linting is very important inside of your editor. If I write bad CSS, um, for instance, if I use multiple classes side by side, CSS lint will actually tell me, you can see in the, in the footer down here, don't use the joining classes. That one's actually um, fine if you're working in anything newer than IE7. So um, I just included that as sort of a default error message that you can see. But um, it will actually warn you when you write bad CSS. So for example, maybe a better example would be um, warnings for missing vendor prefixes. Um, so I included the WebKit one, but I didn't include Opera and um, Microsoft, for example. Um, and it'll also warn you if um, you've used unnecessary vendor prefixes. So for example, border radius. I don't do vendor prefixes on border radius, even in professional projects anymore, um, just because it's no longer needed. Um, and if you want to look at a great up-to-date resource for vendor prefixes, um, CSS3 Please is a, is a great one. It actually lists the browser support for the individual prefixes, and they'll remove unnecessary ones. Or you can decide for yourself um, based on the support listings there. All those are not easy to read, huh? Uh, there we go. You'll notice they still have um, WebKit border radius, but I would recommend not using that since it's not really necessary. <clears throat> Let's see, where are we? Um, judiciously use a preprocessor. Uh, I'm using, I'm actually using SAS for this presentation. Um, Let's see. Oops. Okay. I think I go over that in the next slide. I like SAS, so let's use SAS. Um, it's great for vendor prefixes. Um, Compass has some great built-in um, mix-ins that you can use. So, for example, I can write um, include background image. Uh, I want to do a linear gradient. Linear gradients or gradients in general are just um, kind of known to be a mess when it comes to cross-browser compatibility. Um, so Compass kind of solves this problem for you um, and expands this code to be this inside of your CSS. So it just makes authoring quite a bit easier. And also use, oops, oh my god, file a bug on GitHub. Um, I also use mix-ins. So for example, if I want something to be um, visible to screen readers, um, I don't, you don't want to use display none. Um, because display none hides things from screen readers, it completely ignores them. Um, so I use this mix in to make something not visual on the page, um, not visual to a sighted user, but still accessible to a screen reader. So if I have a um, maybe like a collapsible, the content inside of that, I might want to do um, or hide the content using this mechanism when it's collapsed. And using that, it's pretty easy. I just include the mix-in name here. So sweet. Responsive web design. How does it look on mobile? So I'm going to bring up the iOS simulator here. And I know iOS is not triple equals to mobile, but bear with me here. So it doesn't look great. Um, it's kind of super zoomed out, and you can't really read anything. So let's click this tiny link in the bottom. So let's we added a viewport here. So the viewport kind of tells the browser um, what the visual uh, uh, viewport should be to the user. So we use the device width. So on iOS, I believe it's uh, for iOS 4 at least it's 320 pixels wide. Um, so it just sets the default um, viewable viewport to be 320 pixels wide. And you can do that in CSS or HTML. So a side note about, wait, let me go back here. So here's the CSS3 media queries that I was using to sort of move those navigation links around. Um, I just set a min width here of 31 M's. And I'm using M's for my media queries because, funny, just as a note, I don't know if I can resize this. 
So you'll notice that's kind of the 31M switch there. You can see the next button moving. Um, but also we want our CSS3 uh, media queries to reevaluate when we zoom in and zoom out on the page. Um, you'll notice that WebKit does not do this. Um, see how the next button is still down here. So let's go to... <clears throat> so I have this hard-coded to, I believe, 640 by 480. This is um, Firefox. You guys know Firefox, right? <laughs> People still use Firefox. Um, it has an awesome responsive web design mode. Um, so you can actually resize the um, viewport here inside of um, the browser. Um, and this is really great because you could resize the viewport of the Chrome browser manually or using a Chrome extension, but it actually resizes the whole window, um, which makes the dev tools really hard to get to sometimes, and you have to put them in a different window, and it's kind of a pain in the ass. Um, so responsive design inside of, um, or this mode inside of uh, Fire Firefox is really good. Um, and you'll notice when we zoom in far enough, I didn't really do that as good, but um, when you zoom in far enough, it will actually reevaluate your media queries. So this is giving the smaller screen layout, um, even though I'm running on 640 by 480. So here's the default zoom, and here's where the media, media query retriggered. So let's go back here. <clears throat> All right, I don't think I'm going to go over this, um, but I did include it just for kicks on how to pick color schemes. I'm just going to skip over that. I'm kind of running out of time. Um, so what we're going to do next um, is we're going to add some JavaScript. So it's it's been kind of a pain for me to find this link and click it on every different slide. Um, so what I'm going to do is add some keyboard navigation. Um, so we use our JavaScript fork from earlier. Get all elements by class name and the WebKit or the BlackBerry WebKit thing. Um, and then we'll add keyboard navigations for left and right arrow keys um, and a WebKit or a web font from Google. So if it's a modern browser, in my opinion, I'll load the um, web font in JavaScript. Um, and you can kind of see that the font up here changed. Or it's not that, I don't know, maybe you can't tell. But to me, it looks different. It looks way better now. Um, and I'm also going to use vanilla JavaScript, not using jQuery. So let's see here. Let's bring it up. <clears throat> so here's my fork. If it fails that, return. If not, find our key event listeners um, and load the Google Web Font. Pretty, pretty easy. Not too hard. Um, and so now I can do, oh my god, I didn't even have to click. It's so awesome. Um, this is the part of the slideshow where it gets easier for me. Um, so I'm not using jQuery because I don't need, I, I'm not doing a ton of JavaScript on this page, um, and it's just extra kilobytes that aren't, aren't necessary. Um, and like um, Ted kind of talked about in the keynote this morning, so we should also always be reevaluating our tools, always be reevaluating any preconcep preconceived notions that we have about our tools moving forward. So I could have very easily used jQuery on this page and bumped up the page weight by 20 kilobyte, um, but I didn't, I didn't need it. I mean, might have made authoring a little bit easier, um, but vanilla JavaScript is, is something that's just going to expand and expand, and less things are going to start using jQuery as time moves on. So be ready for it. Um, and if I wanted to load more JS or CSS asynchronously after page load, um, I'd do it with, yep, nope. Another great thing about um, me loading this web font in JavaScript um, is that I do it not using a, a a CSS style sheet in the header, which would have blocked page the page from rendering, um, I would do it in JavaScript, and it gave me kind of a little bit of flash of unstyled text. Oops, wrong keys trick. Um, but to me, the performance of showing the page uh, Im as immediately as possible is better than a very small flash of unstyled text. Oh, let's use the arrow keys. Yeah. Um, just an, a little side note about font faces inside of the, the dev tools. Um, if you're trying to figure out if the font face is successfully applied on the page, um, it's not really easy inside of WebKit. So let's look at my H1. 
you can see I'm loading the bitter font from Google. Um, there's no real way to tell. It doesn't cross out which ones it doesn't use. Um, there's no real way, good way to tell if it's actually applied and loaded on the page. Um, so another commercial for Firefox here. Let's go to the slide. So <laughs> there's two different development tools for Firefox right now, and I don't know why. Um, but there's the built-in ones to the browser, and that's what I kind of showed with the responsive web design view. Um, and also there's Firebug, which has been around forever, and it's awesome. Um, but Firebug will actually show you which font has been successfully applied. It puts a different font color on it. Um, and it gives you a li nice little hover preview so you can tell um, if your web font is successfully loaded. There we go. Um, so a few tips on authoring JavaScript. Um, don't rely on it or use too much of it. Um, it. And if your site requires JavaScript, you forfeit the right to complain about supporting old browsers. You see all these people complain about, oh, I don't want to support IE7, I don't want to support IE6. Okay, serve them HTML. You're supporting it. You're giving a C-grade experience, but you're still supporting the browser. right? This, the thing should still be functional. The content is still there. It just doesn't look pretty. So. I have opinions about browser support. Um, I love this tweet by Jake Archibald, who works for Google now. He said, um, if someone says we don't have any non-JavaScript users, his response is, no, all of your users are non-JavaScript while the JavaScript is downloading. And so as networks are getting worse and worse and we're moving more towards um, 3G networks, edge networks, mobile networks that are just really, really shitty, um, JavaScript, the time between the page rendering and when JavaScript finishes loading is getting bigger. Um, so this is something we need to worry about. Um, so use JS hint. How am I doing on time? Does anyone know? Okay, I should probably wrap it up here. Um, so I'll kind of go through this a little bit quicker. Um, I use JS hint, so that gives me um, inline linting um, inside of my editor. So it will show me on a line when I make an error. So let's see here. So it highlights it here and it gives me an error down at the bottom. It makes authoring a little bit easier. Um, it warns when I'm not using strict mode. Maybe if I made bad just double equals comparisons instead of triple equals comparisons because of JavaScript's type coercion problems. Um, and it has a bunch of other ones. So linting inside of your editor is very important. Um, and also use strict. Um, just for dev, don't put in product, production code, otherwise you might run into problems. Oh, I don't, I keep forgetting about the arrow keys. All right, Whew. man, how do we do? So let's check the slideshow. Um, I have YSlow and PhantomJS. Um, so I run this command and it hits. So PhantomJS is a, a headless webkit. Um, so it goes out to the site fetches the HTML content um, and renders it inside of WebKit, so a live, real view of your website, um, non-visually, non obviously. Um, <clears throat> but it will actually give you some nice uh, metrics here. So YSLO is a tool, a performance benchmarking tool put out by Yahoo a while back. Um, and so it's a really good way to measure my page weight. Um, so in the very beginning, this is slide, z slide one. Um, I only had 0.3k worth of content on the page. Um, two requests. What was that other request, I wonder? I didn't have any images. Do you like CSS? I didn't have any CSS, yeah. Favicon? Oh yeah, that, that's probably what it is, yeah. It's probably a favicon. Um, because browsers request the favicon by default, even if it doesn't exist. Um, so here's the when we added HTML5. Bumped up the page weight, oh my gosh, to so high, so high. Um, that site would look good on 56K, man. That's a tiny. Here's when we added CSS. Bumped up the number of requests to three. Um, page size is 3.4K. So the average site right now, um, if you go out and look at, I uh, can't remember what the site, but they do like, they do a, uh, do a bunch of benchmarking for top thousand sites. And the average site is like, I think nearing a meg now, so sites are getting fatter and fatter. Um, so we always need to worry about page weight. Um, so here's what happened when we added the font face and the JavaScript. Um, so 
quite a bit better, um, or quite a bit bigger, mostly because of the font face. Here's another tool called uh, WBench. We'll actually give you really, really detailed information on um, individual events inside of how your page renders. Uh, so that was that page was so slow. We can do a little bit better. We can use Grunt um, to minify and concat our JavaScript and CSS. Um, so here's just a basic, real basic four-step process to do Grunt. Um, you need a package JSON, which I don't really have time to go into. But um, so we'll concat all of our CSS and JavaScript into one file to reduce HTTP requests. Um, we'll use Uglify to do JS minification. We we'll use CSS min to remove all the white space and minify our CSS. Um, another tool that I really like to use is called Grunticon. Um, it's wrote by one of my coworkers, Scott Gell. Um, it takes a directory full of SVG icons um, and outputs um, PNG fallbacks for those. So if the browser supports SVG, um, it'll show the SVG icons. If not, it will, um, in IE8 and whatever doesn't support SVG, it'll fall back to PNGs. Um, and if you use an SVG for, um, which is very, very useful for retina screens, um, use SVGO, which is an optimizer tool. Um, and here's just the output of Grunt. I will do JS hint, concat, compress, uglify. Another great thing about Grunt is that you can set it to watch files on your file system and it will run automatically when you edit stuff. So live reload wouldn't concat and minify your JavaScript for you, but Grunt will. So Grunt, when, you, when, I, edit a, when I edit a CSS file or a JavaScript file, it will concat, and minify, whatever, um, and then live reload will pick up those changes and reload my browser for me also. So those tools work great together. Um, and I think I'm getting towards the end here. So I just wanted to do a very, very quickly uh, slide about device and platform testing. I have one local virtual machine that I use for Windows testing. Um, it has IE9, which includes fake IE8 and IE7. Um, and I use Browser Stack for the rest. Browser Stack is amazing. It costs money, but it's amazing. Oh, let's go to, so I can do, they handle all the virtual machines for you. So if I had a bug that was just limited to Windows XP, I don't have to have my own virtual machine for that. They have all browser versions. It's unbelievable. So it's like a remote desktop session. But yep. you know Exactly, yep. <clears throat> so they manage all that stuff for you. Oops. Um, and my work bought me a couple of devices. I'm a remote worker, so I work from home. They bought me a couple of Blackberries and an old Android and um, some things to test with. But um, if you don't have that, there is a site dedicated to Open Device Labs. We don't have one um, in Nebraska. If you guys want if somebody wants to open one, that would be really awesome, um, and donate a bunch of devices for people to use, this would be a really great contribution to the development community if we had something like this around here. Um, because you obviously doesn't scale to buy every single little mobile device that exists. Um, so if any company is looking to do something really cool for the development community around here, open a device lab. So, in conclusion, it's not just our job to make websites, it's our job to improve our efficiency. And don't be afraid to discard what you have for something that might be better. Um, tools are important. Spend a little time every day improving your workflow in some way. Um, and your best tool is your brain. Use it. That's it, guys.